Hello, my name is Lano, and you are listening to Lano's Corner, where I talk about something for half an hour, unscripted, and usually from memory. Today I'm talking about something which is very near and dear to my heart, and that is Mercedes Lackey's Valdemar series, The Velgarth Universe. I have been reading these books for a long time, probably about 20 years, and they've had a huge effect on me as a person and as an author, but I never really talk about them in depth, and I have a lot to say about it. Actually, I will probably come back to this topic and do multiple videos about it, but for now, what I'm doing is ranking the various Valdemar series from my least favorite to my favorite. And if you have known me for more than two seconds, you can probably guess which one is my favorite, but just pretend for now that you don't know that. Now, I want to make it clear that this is all based on my personal opinion. I'm ranking these based on my enjoyment of the books. Uh, I'm not talking about them in quality, and I want to say that because I have a huge emotional connection to the series, and I feel like a lot of the fans are probably also very passionate, and I'm sure I might upset some people, or people will disagree with me, and that's 100% fine. This is just my opinion of the series. So, number 15, the very bottom of the barrel, is the only series that you can say I dislike, and it is the Vows and Honor trilogy. And there are two reasons that I don't like it. One of them is really petty, so we'll get that out of the way first, and that is, Mercedes Lackey said in the introduction, when she was writing Tarma, uh, Tarma was a response to the current fantasy heroine who we're all apparently butch lesbians, and I just want to ask, like, where are all of these butch lesbian fantasy novels? I'm asking for a friend. I mean, I'm sure that this was a real thing, and they were probably all written by men, and I don't actually want to read them, but the fact that it specifically stated that Tarma was supposed to be a straight response to this butch lesbian stereotype kind of irks me, because there's a lot of gay characters in Valdemar, but not a lot of lesbians, and uh, the ones we do get are not usually important. So, you know, but that's really petty. The real reason that I don't like them is because there's always a lot of, like, rape and sexual assault, or at least the threat of it, in Valdemar books, and usually I can just kind of roll my eyes, like, yeah, you have a fetish, I get it, but these books make my skin crawl. Like, the uh, the rape scenes in this series are just, like, absolutely not. And I don't find Tarma or Kethry very interesting, so I'm not willing to put up with something that makes me uncomfortable for characters that I find boring. And that is why it's the bottom. I have read them one time, and I probably will never read them again. Number 14 is the anthologies, collectively. Now... I have not read all of them. I think there are about six that I'm missing, and I didn't realize I was that far behind. But these only kind of count, and I didn't want to buy them all before I made this video, so I'm going with the ones I've read. And the second best of these is the Scooby-Doo one, where the mystery gang are all heralds, because that's hilarious, but I don't actually remember the plot. And the best one is the one with the Civil War and the griffin who absorbs too much magic and becomes phosphorescent, and he uses this to fly in the air and draw uh, the crest of Valdemar to be like, stop fighting, you stupid assholes, this is not what Valdemar is about. And uh, that's the best one. I consider something good if I can remember the plot, even years after I've read it, and I consider something great if I can remember specific lines of dialogue and specific plot points. So, these are all good. The Griffin one is the best, because that's the one I remember the best. So, we're going there. I'm sure the other ones are also all good. Um, None of the stories are bad, necessarily, and someday I will get the other anthologies and read them, but I don't really think my opinion is going to change. Number 13 is Take a Thief. And this is the only one that I reread before recording this, because I had no memory of it whatsoever. And this is a weird book. I actually went and looked up when it had been published, because I would have assumed that it had been published after the Exiles books, um, because of where it sits, squished between the Arrows trilogy and the Exile books, and uh, no, it was actually published before them, so I don't know why 
it feels like the story has no room to breathe and be its own thing. It's not really a story. It's, um, it's basically Skiff's biography. And if you like Skiff, that's fine. Uh, of the three people I know who have read Valdemar books, two of them are really into Skiff. And I certainly have nothing against him as a character. I think he's funny. I like his journey. Uh, I love how he gets chosen um, when Simri pretends to be a regular horse and, like, tricks him into stealing her and then kidnaps him and dumps him on the ground in the woods outside of the city. Like, let's talk about this because you're going to be a herald and I don't want you to run away before we can talk it out. And uh, that's how he becomes a herald and that's really funny. But, like, just in terms of being a book, it's really weird. And also I had no memory of it, so that is why it sits at number 13. Number 12 is the Arrows Trilogy. I do think this is a good introduction. I think Talia makes a really good everyman character to bring us into the world, but because it is first, it kind of suffers that thing where, like, it's not as much of itself as the other later books are, and, like, that's just really common with long series like this, so you can't hold that against it. Um, but I do really like Talia. I love how she interacts with Elspeth in the beginning. I love in the second book how, um, because they didn't realize that empathy worked differently than other gifts, because it's not usually a herald thing, it's a healer thing. And so she wasn't properly trained, and when she goes out to ride circuit with Chris, uh, she almost kills them both, because she gets locked in this like self-destructive spiral of self-doubt and negative emotions, and it nearly destroys her. And so she has to spend all that time, like, unlearning stuff that she half learned and then relearning things properly in order to use her gift. I like that a lot. Um, there are also CDs. Of, if you don't know that, there are CDs with all the songs and a lot of the songs about the Arrows trilogy I really enjoy a lot. Uh, they're very good, but just because it is slash was the first, I don't think it's as strong. And also, this is where we get most of our lesbian characters, and they're like background characters, if that, and one of them dies. And I don't appreciate that, because in the book it says they could have gone on to be one of the rare life-bonded threesomes, and like, why did we not get a life-bonded lesbian threesome? Why? Why did you do that? So yes, this is number 12. Number 11 is the Mage Winds trilogy. And uh, when I first started reading these in middle school, I read them as they were available to me, and my library either didn't have this series or it was always checked out, so I never actually read it until a few years ago when I bought it for myself. And if you've read Valdemar, then you know that this is kind of the book that ties the whole thing together. And uh, I had that moment, you know, that like, oh, a lot of things make sense now kind of moment. Um, and this one, this one's about Elspeth as she, when, as an adult, and, uh, Darkwind and setting up stuff that happens later. I don't remember, I remember enjoying it, and I mostly remember laughing about how funny it was that, like, out of all of the old Valdemar books, uh, other than the anthologies, out of all the old books, this was the one, this was the series that I read last, and just how ridiculous that is. Number 10 is the Herald Spy Trilogy, and um, this is just, out of all of the series about mags, I feel like this is the one that's the least interesting. Like, it is interesting to have a Herald who is a spy, because that's not usually what they do, and I feel like um, Albrick and Skiff were kind of the prototypes that led to this character. But we have three series that involve him, and this one is just the least interesting. Uh, well, I do like the stuff with... Um, Harold Nicholas, the king's own, when he drowns, and then his daughter Amelie gets chosen to be the new king's own, but they resuscitate him, and so he gets chosen by another companion, and then he's just a regular Harold now, and they're both alive. Like, that's funny. I appreciate anything weird like that, so I like that part. Um, but generally, like, I don't find it that interesting. I mostly remember them getting kidnapped a lot, and uh, I guess the sleepgiver stuff, but it's not really that fun. Um, mostly, like, although I like Mags, I'm really hoping that she's kind of done with him now, uh, because I'm really interested, I'm really invested in Valdemar, and I want to know everything about Velgarth history. So, like, between 
the Mage Wars trilogy and the Last Herald Mage trilogy, there's 1700 years of history that is not explored at all. What happened after the original Cataclysm? What happened to the White Griffin and the Hyle? What happened at the founding of Valdemar? Um, like, literally anything. Uh, what happens after the Owl trilogy when the world is completely new? Like, I want to know. So I do appreciate mags, but like, this is not the best mag series. Number nine is the Mage Storms trilogy. And if I had to point to which Valdemar series had the most effect on me as an author, it's definitely this one. Uh, because this is the one where they bring up the idea that because magic is natural, it can be explained mathematically and, you know, like charted and understood. And that makes the mages really mad, or at least the one, like, is it Firesong? Is that his name? He gets really mad because magic is art. Magic isn't science, but of course it's science. And that in particular had a huge effect on the way that I think about magic and the way that I put it into my own world building. So yeah, all of my books are because of this. And if you don't like my writing, blame this series. Um, I also appreciate it. There's a lot of reasons I appreciate it. Uh, I like having Kars shown in a different light. I like having a main-ish character who is from Kars. I love the Sun Cats. I can't remember his name, but like he has that one line of dialogue when it gets revealed that the companions are reborn heralds, and he just says it so flippantly. He says something like, well, I imagine there are more dead heralds than dead sons of the sun, and like that's it. Like that's so funny to me. I love that idea. And uh just the whole idea of the mage storms in that you know, 2,000 years ago, you had the cataclysm, which was like dropping a pebble into a puddle and the echoes go out. And now the magic and like it changed everything about magic. And now 2,000 years later, it's all echoing back in, going in reverse. And uh, like, even if you can understand magic mathematically, like nobody would have predicted that happening. And it kind of makes me wonder, like the second cataclysm going inwards was less intense than the first, but only kind of. So is this going to keep happening like every 2000 years? Is it just going out and in and out and in until magic is stable? Or uh, was it just like a two time thing? I mean, that's not really important. I'm just kind of interested in this idea that like the ripples that affected magic took 2000 years to hit the edge of the pond and <laughs> make their way back in. And now it's ruining everything again. Uh, so yeah, I just I really enjoyed this one for a lot of reasons. Number eight is By the Sword, which I think works really well as a standalone novel. And it is tied in with the Vows and Honor trilogy. So I can only assume that Carowin has the effect on me that Tarma was supposed to, but I actually like Carowin as a character. Um, I really enjoy this kind of like practical, down to earth female characters. Um, I really like that personality in female characters. And she definitely has that because, you know, she's a mercenary and later a mercenary captain. I like seeing stuff set outside the uh, the borders of Valdemar, and I like all the stuff with her as a mercenary. And when she gets chosen, her companion is Sable. And I can only assume that that is Vaniel's aunt, Sable, because if the companions are reborn heralds, then... I mean, Valdemar has a record of all the heralds, so clearly the companions would need slightly different names, but those look similar enough that, like, I would pronounce them the same way, so I'm assuming that was the intention. I believe that was the intention. But my favorite part of this novel, actually, is the, um, the fact that when Carolyn was a teenager, she had her very famous ride where she went and she saved her sister-in-law, and then it became a famous ballad. And when the mercenary company goes to Valdemar and they find out that the Ballad of Caro's Ride has spread all the way to Valdemar, then the mercenaries under her command find this hysterical. And at every single village that they stop at, they want to hear the local version. And Caro finds it really annoying because she doesn't care about music and she doesn't want to like just listen to people talking about this dumb shit that she did as a teenager over and over. But they think it's funny and so they request it every time and she's just like, why? Why? Um, and that's just like, it's so not important to the story as a whole, but it's like those really fantastic little character moments that make characters seem really real. And I just really appreciate that kind of humor, I guess, that little plot. 
number seven is the Collegium Chronicles, and mostly I was just really excited for her to come back to Valdemar because I had been reading the Elemental Masters series, which I do enjoy, they're good, but it's not Valdemar. Valdemar is special. So it was really cool to get something new, and I like Mags and Amelie and, uh, what, Lydia and, uh, Ced Cedric? Uh, whatever his name is. Um, I like them as kids. I really like characters like Mags, like Talia and Skiff and Albrecht and Mags, who come from really bad places and get pulled all of a sudden into this culture of love and support and acceptance, and they have to learn how to live with that and, like, learn how to trust people, kind of. Like, I am a sucker for that. I love it every time. So, like, I do really like them as kids, but the reason that, like, this one is so much higher than the Herald Spy trilogy is because of Kerbal. Yes, Kerbal. I love Kerbal. I know it's also in the other one, but, like, this is where it is, right? Um, the fact that, like, this started out as, like, a training exercise, and, uh, then someone was like, hey, you can make a game out of this, and they did, and so the Heralds have teams, and people loved it and got so obsessed with it that they adapted the game to be played with regular horses, and then it spread as a sport all the way across Valdemar. Like, that's that's fantastic because, again, that's a type of thing that makes a world feel real, and uh, I love that. I love Kerbal. I also like how it, it fits into Mag's cover story later, where he's just like, Harold Mags, nice but boring, former Kerbal champion, nothing else. But, of course, he's very intelligent and uh, goes on to be the spy master of Valdemar, so, like, yeah. I just like it. I like them as kids. And I like seeing Amelie get her operation and being able to walk, and I like Kerbal, and so I appreciate the Collegium Chronicles. Also, it was nice to go back and get something uh, set in an era where we, we only had one novel set in this time period, so it was all kind of new. That's, that's pretty cool, too. Number six is the Exile books, Exile's Honor and Exile's Valor, and uh, this is mostly because I really love Albrecht. But I love everything different. You can't really say that Valdemar is formulaic in the way that something like Redwall is formulaic, but it definitely has, like, an ideal. And the farther that things deviate from the expected norm, the more likely I am to like it, usually. And, uh, you can't really get much farther from the expected norm than having a herald born in Kars, right? So, I love Albrecht. I, I love, like, he's, you know, he's like 20-something when he's chosen, and um, Cantor, so Cantor gets across the country lines, tricks the Karsites into thinking that he's just a horse, somehow arranges things so that he's Albrecht's horse, and then when everything blows up, he just whisks him away across the border to be a herald, but uh, Albrecht comes from a place where the companions are viewed as demons and the heralds are viewed as heretics, and he has to completely change the way that he thinks about the world. Um, I really love that. Uh, so I really like the first book because it's about him and, and Carson when he first comes out. Um, but I do like, I love Harold Mist. Uh, I think she's funny, so I really like her as his partner because nobody would have seen that relationship coming, but they're perfect for one another and they're super adorable. Um, I also like the, uh, this is when the Tedril Wars happen, I think, and there's, like, in the Tedril camp, there's all the orphan kids, or, like, just the kids that nobody pays attention to, and Vikandus, the Sun Lord, actually, like, came down as a little kid and, like, took control of this group of kids and, like, they made their own religion, and he basically did this so that when the Heralds came to rescue the children from, uh, the Tedral a mercenary nation, like, they wouldn't resist because they would think that the companions were holy. And just, like, this idea that this this religion is really beautiful and has been twisted by Kars and, like, Vikandus has no problem with Valdemar and, like, he wants stuff to be, you know, fixed. Just, like, I like that. That's a cool little, little thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I just, I really love Albrecht, though. He's a great character. So I always like stuff with him in it. Number five is the Family Spies trilogy, and let me tell you, I did not expect this. 
Um, when I was first planning this out and I was listing all the books in the order that I thought I would like them in, I thought my top five were really solid. And um, because this series only had the first two books in paperback, I just bought them and I was just going to read the first two and then uh, figure out where they fit in the bottom 10, you know? And that is not what happened. I, um, these books really gave me the feeling that I used to have as a kid reading these for the first time. Um, even though I'm not like, I've got tendon damage in my arms and I can't really hold a book for a long period of time, I still read all three of these in the span of six days. I checked out the third one as an ebook from the library because I could not stop after the second one like oh my god I love these oh, I, I liked these so much more than I expected and um, there's a lot of stuff to like about them I like that these are about characters who are not only not heralds although Tori gets chosen on like the last page of the third book but for the most part these are people who live right in Haven not even in Haven they live in the palace surrounded by heralds and none of them are chosen um, they're Mag and Amelie's kids, and there's not really an overarching plot so much as just, like, they're Mags and Amelie's kids, and each one of them gets their own book, and that's really cool. I, I love having a, like, an extended plot, but I also like stuff like this. Um, I really like Perry's book. I like having a character bond to a Kyrie, because that doesn't happen very often. The Kyrie aren't really in it, even though I now have to accept that they speak like Scooby-Doo, and the Scooby-Doo heralds are in here and in this book sort of. Well, Shaggy is in here. Um, and uh, it reminded me a lot of the Silver Griffin, kind of, which I really like, so, you know, there's that. Um, I basically, I, like, did not want to put this one down. I had so much fun reading it. The second one, though, we finally got a main-ish lesbian character who doesn't die. Jix. Jix is awesome. But Abby is more important. I mean, obviously she's the main character, but, like, Abby is asexual, probably aromantic, likes books a lot, doesn't like babies, <laughs> same, honestly. Um, every asexual person is really different, and uh, I'm sure that like this is not the case for everyone, but there's this thing in media now, as far as I've read, with asexual characters always ending up in a romantic relationship, which I'm sure is really validating for a lot of people, but it doesn't really resonate with me. So I thought it was really cool to have a character like Abby, who I can actually kind of relate to a little bit. Um, also, the second book was such an on-the-nose, intentional critique of current American politics, and I was not expecting that. Like, obviously, Valdemar uses a lot of topics which are important to Americans, like, you know, like refugees and um, immigrants and religion and fanaticism. Um, and, like, that kind of stuff, but it's not usually, like, a one-to-one -one ratio critique, and I thought that was so funny because I, like, I didn't see it coming, and I just kind of laughed the entire time. And the one thing is, like, unfortunately, I know very little about architecture or math, and I'm not good at picturing stuff in my head, so she clearly did so much research about bridges and, like, how bridges work, and I, like, I can't appreciate any of it. The architecture stuff kind of, like, made my eyes glaze over, but I really enjoyed it nonetheless. And then the third one, like, I didn't expect this to happen, um, but I really wanted Key and Tori to be gay because, like, despite what I just said, um, I typically relate more to gay characters written by women than I do to asexual characters or lesbians, like, ever. Um, written by anybody. So, like, I wanted them to be gay, especially because Key takes after Vaniel, but then it, it was just like, oh, no, he's a mage. Although the, um, the thing with, like, one of the princes of Valdemar leaves the borders and immediately, like, his mage gift opens and, um, he can't ever go back to Valdemar. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I do like his relationship with Sira. Although I, I don't believe for one hot second that uh, they aren't life bonded. Like, it's not instant, you know? Uh, Talia and Dirk were life bonded for like at least a few months before she went out with Chris, and she and Chris slept together when they were riding Circuit. And um, Amber Drake and Winterheart were life bonded for who knows how long when she was still with what's his name, that asshole that she was with at the beginning. Um, so, like, it's not like you life bond and then you're immediately attached at the hip. It's like, he could have left 
and he would have been miserable, but, like, yeah, I believe they're life bonded. She does seem to be getting away from the life bonding stuff, which is, like, a shame. I don't know if it's just not something that people want to read about these days, but, like, I really like it. I know it's, it's kind of weird and, like, borderline and, um, maybe questionable, but, like, the idea of it's really fascinating to me and I'm really, really interested in it, so I will be sad if it goes away forever, but, you know, oh well. Um, I still found this book really good and really exciting. Um, I just, like, this whole trilogy, I enjoyed so much more than I, I thought that I would, so it ended up being really surprising and I love it a lot. I'm sure, I mean, I'm gonna get the third one as soon as it comes out in paperback, definitely. Like, I own all of these, so, you know, there's that. If you haven't read it, definitely give it a shot. Number four is the Owl Trilogy, and um, this one I like for some reasons, but, you know, we have to have story time first, so my library did not have this either. I read this at summer camp. Like a lot of girls, I went to Girl Scout camp every summer for my entire school career, and one summer when I was in middle school, I went to camp, and my camp counselor was reading these books, and I was really excited about it, because like, ooh, Valdemar books that I haven't read yet. Um, and so I asked if I could read them when she was done. And uh, she said those words that are a curse on every child who reads a lot and reads above their level. Uh, yeah, right. Um, that the books were not appropriate for children, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like, I've always viewed Valdemar as being pretty middle grade adjacent. So, you know, like, yeah, they're appropriate for kids. I read them as a kid, mostly. Um, so I was like, okay. And I went back to read the books that I had brought for the summer, which, see, bear with me here. The books that I had brought for the summer were Anne McCaffrey's A Corner series. Let that sink in for a minute. I mean, I guess they're at like a similar level, but I would say those are more adult. You know, they're, they're a lot more dense at any rate. But um, yeah, so she saw me reading those and was like, your parents let you read this? And I was like, my mom doesn't care what I read because she trusts me to be able to tell what's too much for me. So then she let me read the Owl series. So that's a really fond memory for me. Um, but that's not the only reason that I like it. I like having a series that is set in the middle of goddamn nowhere, just outside of the Pelagir. I like the stuff with the Hawk Brothers. I like the stuff with the Barbarians. I like Darien trying to find his parents. I like the stuff with the Plague. I like having characters that aren't really heralds. I like having something set after the Cataclysm, where the world is completely new and different. Like, okay, by the way, um, so after the first Cataclysm, the Hawk Brothers were given the task by the Star-Eyed Goddess to cleanse the land and, like, fix magic. And they've been doing this for 2,000 years, and now they have to start over. What kind of bullshit is that? Oh, man, I feel bad for them. But, yeah, I really like this trilogy. Um, my only, like, complaint about it, really, is, uh, well, she does two things in writing that really annoy me. And one is whenever she needs to recap something, she'll copy and paste full paragraphs from other books, which is just, like, a lazy method to save time. Like, I know she writes these really quickly, but come on. And the, uh, the second one is that different characters will often come to the same conclusions at the same time in different places using the exact same wording. And the worst example of this is in the Owl books. In the first book, when Darian gets really upset and he runs into the woods and he's just, like, fuming about how people treat him and treat the memory of his parents. And then, like, in town, the wizard, who I want to say, is his name Justin? That seems, like, way too normal. But, like, Justin, I guess, the wizard, is um, having the exact same realization. And it's, like, it's not like I don't think that um, the wizard would be able to figure out why his charge was unhappy and kept running away. But, uh, like, older man is not going to view things in the same way as, like, a 13 or 14-year-old boy. So the fact that they both came to these same conclusions at the same time in the same wording is just, like, lazy and bad writing. I don't like it. Um, but that's, like, a minor thing, because it happens all the time in her books, so, like, whatever. The other thing that I like about the Owl trilogy is Lily. Lily is my favorite background character in any Valdemar book. Um, like I said, I really love practical down-to-earth women, and Lily is definitely that. Like, if you've listened to the CDs, um, then you've heard Lily's song and know that she is not the town prostitute by choice. She did not have a choice. And 
she doesn't really like the way that she's treated, but you know, when the army invades, she still makes herself available to the army and she keeps them from messing with the more respectable women of the town. And then afterwards, she takes all of this jewelry that she earned and she just splits. She goes somewhere else where no one knows who she is and she can be respectable. And like, I really respect that. I love Lily as a character. I love this kind of, this kind of character. I love this storyline that she has. I just, I think about her a lot for like a character who's not very important. Um, so yeah, definitely like good setting. Um, I want to know more about what happens after the owl books. Like, please, please, I want to know. So, you know, yeah, really fun. I like it a lot. Have fond memories of reading it and trying not to get eaten alive by mosquitoes. You know, the usual. Number three is Brightly Burning. Um, like, I'll be real. The, the main reason this is as high as it is is because I love tragedies. I love tragedies and reading tragedies, and that is exactly what this is. I think it works well as a standalone novel, and at the time, it was really exciting to have something set at a period where no other books were set, and now it's around the same time as Mag's, but, like, at the time, it was just this. I like Lavon as a character. Um, I like that his gift is so insanely powerful that he has to not only be chosen by a companion, but also life-bonded to his companion, and, like, that's so weird! I wonder if that's ever happened before or since. I mean, like, probably not. I can't imagine this this kind of thing happens, but, like, that's so fascinating to me. Um, I just, I think it's a really good tragedy. I have read it a lot. I've read it, if, I mean, I've, I've read it, like, probably three or four times, and I have enjoyed it every time that I've read it. So, you know, I just, I like tragedies. I like the character. I like the setup. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's just, I just like it. That's all. I don't have nearly as much to say about this one as I do some of the stuff lower on the list, but, like, it's up here because I like it, and that's what matters. Number two is the Mage Wars trilogy. Um, look, I, I owe Larry Dixon my life. I have been obsessed with griffins since I was very young, and he clearly is also obsessed with griffins, and he is the reason that griffins are in the Valdemar series at all, and for that I am profoundly grateful. These were, as you can imagine, like the, um, these were the first Valdemar books that I read because griffins, and I love them. These are the ones that I have read more than any other books in the series. I love all of them. I love, this is another series where each of them are different. So like the black griffin is a war story, and the second, or the, the second, the white griffin is like a murder mystery, and the the third one, the Silver Griffin, is a survival horror novel. I love it. I love it. The Silver Griffin is my favorite out of these, actually. It's so weird and, like, different. Um, if, if someone came up to me and they were like, tell me one Valdemar book that I should read, and they've never read anything else, the Silver Griffin is the one that I would recommend. Um, just because it's so fun, and, like, I think it really works even knowing what happens, like, knowing what it is and what happens and what they go through and, like, the fact that they're just fine at the end, because of course they are, um, that doesn't make the book any less effective, you know? And part of it is just, like, reading it, like, ooh, that's so scary. Like, what would I do if it was me? Like, I would die. I would get eaten. No question, I would not survive. But, you know, it's fun. I like that one a lot. Um, I like the characters, of course. I love griffins, so, you know, Scandronon is great. Zanil is great. I love, um, was it Aubrey is the one who always gets, uh, shot down. Um, there's the little, the Mistborn, I, God, what is her name? Kahara? Something? Like, she's, she's fun. I don't think that's her name. Um, but, you know, I tried. I just love these books a lot. I, I read them a lot. I think about them a lot. Um, I want more books about griffins. I want more books about griffins. Please. I love griffins so much. Um, yeah, as... It, it, it's important to me just because it was, like, my introduction, but also because I think they're really good books, and I want more books set in the prehistory era. And, like, I want to know what happens to them. Um, like, the Black Griffin is really interesting. Um, the, the Mage War itself is really, like, whoa. And seeing the, the actual cataclysm happen and, like, what caused it and what the effects were over the course of the Black and White Griffin books... It was really fascinating, and uh, this is not, like, revolutionary, but I was still young when I read these. I was, like, 10, maybe, 
and this was the first time that I came across the idea of like who heals the healer and the fact that just because you don't go through something firsthand doesn't mean that you don't bear scars from it because if you're working with people who have been through horrible stuff you're experiencing it secondhand and like that like I said not revolutionary but it was the first time that I had seen it so I thought it was really cool um I just like oh my god I love these books so much I read them so much I love all the characters. I want more Griffin books, please. More more prehistory books, please. Just, you know, everything about it. Read The Silver Griffin. The Silver Griffin is so good. Number one is, very predictably, The Last Herald Mage Trilogy. And there are so many reasons that I like this one. Um, but let's have another story time. So, when Frozen came out, I went to see it in theaters, and like a lot of people who are queer and or have mental illness and I fit both of those boxes I found Elsa to be really familiar and I cried a lot but compared to Vaniel man Elsa's amateur hour like the first time that I read these uh, this was the second series that I read so I was probably still like 10 or 11 or so and I don't remember exactly where I was in the process but I already knew that I wasn't straight at the very least, so I related to Vanuel a lot because he was gay, and I thought it was so cool because at that time, like, you didn't get gay main characters in fantasy books. Like, you didn't really get gay main characters at all, honestly. Um, so that was really cool. And then, like, I liked it, and I came back to them in college after I had had my own very long, drawn-out, emotional, exhausting struggle with clinical depression. And holy shit, I cried so much. I, I'm kind of surprised that I could even see the words on the page, honestly, with how much I cried. I sobbed my way through the entire trilogy. And um, you might wonder, like, why do you want to read something that instantly transports you back to the worst period of your life? And the answer is, like, kind of weird, but reading these books gives me a sense of closure um, in, like a way. Uh, I just, I find it really cathartic. A lot of the things that, like, Vaniel goes through, um, a lot of the ways that his thinking is disordered and things that he thinks and says and does, they, like, I look at him and I see myself. Um, it really resonates with me very strongly. They are, um, they're very heavy. I can't, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting emotional. Um, I can't read them very often. But I do like to read them every once in a while because it does help me that way. Um, and I, I find it really important to kind of like read something that reminds me of what I've been through. Okay, I got, okay, I got that part out. Um, also, these ones, like um, the Magic's Price, the third one, came out the year that I was born. So it was like meant to be. But anyway, disregarding all of that. Um, I also really like it as a story. It is, of course, a tragedy, and it is a very effective tragedy. The, uh, the fact that, um, Vaniel started having nightmares as a teenager, and he knew that he was going to die horribly and alone, and in the third book, um, they come up north to investigate, and they find this invading army, and, like, he knows, it's like, it's now, this is the time, this is the place, and he sends Yafandis and Stefan back south to warn the guard and like obviously he dies horribly and um there's no happy ending the uh the satisfactory part of this the thing that makes it work so well and be so effective to me is that Yafandis makes it back in time not to save Vaniel she makes it back in time to die with him like the fact that Vaniel doesn't die alone is is like it's beautiful. I love it so much. I love these books so much. Um, the fact that that's enough for it to count as, like, a happy ending is phenomenal. Um, but I like other stuff. I, I, I like the story in general. Um, I really like his first relationship with Tylendal and their, like, life bond situation, which never would have worked out well because they were both kind of mentally unstable, and uh, it blew up in the worst way possible. And, um, yeah, when, when Gala, um, when Gala repudi repudiates Tylendal, and, like, that's never happened before in the history of Valdemar, and it has never happened since, like, that shit hurts, man, it hurts. Um, so, like, the, the first 
relationship is like really satisfyingly horrible and then when Ty Lendl gets reincarnated as Stefan <laughs> I love Stefan oh my god so Stefan like just like relentlessly pursuing Vanyal and like trying so hard to make Vanyal understand that he's interested in him and Vanyal's like so freaked out and just like trying to run away the whole time like fantastic they're so good I think they're really cute so you know he does they life bond again and um I like that Vanyal does have somebody like that at the end so I like their little little relationship that they have for like like three months before Vanyal dies or something whatever um I love it I I love the CD. Shadow Stalker is basically the best one. All the songs about Vanyal are really good, and I like to listen to them and get emotional. Um, I just, I also like the kind of character that Vanyal is. Like, he never stops. He might falter occasionally, like after Tylendal kills himself, but he never stops entirely. He always gets up again. And like, even, even when in the second book, I'm pretty sure it was the second book, when he, when he almost dies, and death gives him a choice to die or to wake up and like he knows for a fact that he would wake up to more pain loss grief suffering and he would still die alone um and he still chooses to wake up because people need him and he can do things that nobody else can do and um the the fact that like he's just he accepts that and he knows whether he wakes up or not, this horrible stuff is going to happen, but if he is alive, it will happen more slowly because he is there to help and he chooses that life for himself. And then after he dies, um, he and Yefandis and, and Stefan eventually spend the next 500 years in the Forest of Sorrows protecting the border. And then in the Mage Storms trilogy, they get brought into that and are used as shields to help protect people. And, um, man... I hope, I really hope that they did not get shredded. I hope that they got to go to the real afterlife because after spending 500 years protecting Valdemar with his life, his afterlife, and his second death, he deserves a chance to go to the actual afterlife, right? Like, I don't want him to rest in the way that, like, you no longer exist, so technically you're resting. And I don't think that they need to reincarnate. They have been through enough shit. I just want them to have a chance to actually rest in the afterlife and not have to spend their entire lives and afterlives working for the sake of Valdemar right? Like, is that too much to ask? So, I want to believe that happened. Um, I really love Manuel a lot. I love him so much. I love these books so much. They mean so much to me personally, um, and they've been really helpful over the years. So, that's, like, I mean, people might have expected that just because, like, ooh, gay, but, like, that's not really why, even though, yet, yeah, yeah I, I do like the fact that he's gay, but, you know, that's not the main thing. Um, the main thing is, these books hit me like a knife to the heart, and I love it every time. I'm sure that people, other fans, um, have their own lists, and that's fine. I'm not saying that anybody has to like these books in the order that I like them. But this is my personal experience with the Valdemar series, and I can only hope that there are many, many, many more years and books to come so I can continue to enjoy this universe that has meant so much to me for two-thirds of my life. And that's all I have to say this time. I think it's long enough. So anyway, I'm Lano, and uh, until next time, I'm signing off. Thank you for listening.